Good evening. Uh, the first and only thing I'd really like to say is that we are all farmers by proxy. It is the principle whereby you give someone authority to vote on your behalf. Every single one of us eats. Um, not, it's not one breath Aryan in the room. And every single time we eat, we choose the farmer that produces the food that we eat. Most agriculture in the world is produced in a destructive manner. In addition to that, autistic autism rates are 1 in 68. 20 years ago, it was 1 in 200,000. Cancer everywhere is on a massive, massive increase from a polluted environment, polluted food, whatever reasons. The greatest growth in the, in the speciality of medicine is in oncology, which is fighting cancer. There are 405 dead zones in the world. The biggest dead zone is the, in a, a thing called the Gulf of Mexico, which is bigger than Gauteng. The dead zone is what's called a hypoxic zone. There is no life in it. No oxygen, no fish, no crustaceans. It is directly attributable to the runoff of fertilizers and chemicals, but particularly nitrogen-based fertilizers that are used in conventional agriculture. We are all farmers by proxy. We all choose which farmer produces our food. There are also equal amounts of people in the world dying of, of obesity and starvation. Now, these systems I've been talking about are confined animal operations. They are very heavily chemically dependent. The rainforest is cut down to plant soya and grain to feed these animals. However, there is a thing called regenerative agriculture, which reverses this terrible form of agriculture. It produces food that is nutritious. And the first point about regenerative agriculture is it cannot happen without animals. We practice regenerative agriculture on the farm. We use chickens and cattle. We do a thing called what's called high-density grazing. We have on a little 75-hectare block sequestered carbon of 8,000 tons, which basically means that it's the equivalent carbon generated by 4,000 people flying to London and back. That carbon's been stored in the soil through livestock. I just also want to contrast the specific beef story with um, reference to the point I was making about all being farmers by proxy. So you can choose to buy conventional beef, which is um, animals confined in a feedlot, terrible pollution problems. They fed grain, which they're not designed to, to eat, and then they fed asthma, asthma drugs at the end of their life um, that really help them put on muscle very quickly. All of that contributes to the things I was referring to earlier. Or you can choose to eat grass-fed beef raised in a manner that regenerates the soil. The second most detailed study of um, dietary study of all time is a book called The China Study. And The China Study basically proves that feedlot meat um, causes cancer. And, and we often think about food, but how often do we think about the health of a society as a reflection of the food that it consumes? Okay, so I've got five points I just want to rehash. The first is we're all farmers by proxy. The second is that agriculture is bad. The third point is regenerative agriculture makes agriculture less bad, but it needs animals. The third point is there's never been a healthy society that's been vegetarian. And the fifth point is we're all farmers by proxy. Tonight I'm gonna to argue that the consumption of animal products and the using of meat on our menus is the leading cause of all environmental problems on this planet. In the last 20 years, extreme weather events have increased by 230%. And that's droughts and that's floods. Hurricanes are becoming longer, the hurricane season's becoming longer. And it's all because of man-made reasons. So what is the problem? What is the cause of greenhouse gases? A cow produces 500 liters of methane every single day. We raise for slaughter 70 billion animals every single year. South Africans alone slaughter 2 billion animals every single year. We eat 2.5 million chickens each day. Well, methane is 72 times as strong in warming the atmosphere compared to carbon dioxide. And that comes from cows, as we discussed earlier, and other livestock from farting. If you decide today to drop meat from your menu, 
you will make a difference in five years because methane falls out the atmosphere in five years' time. Every second, an area the size of a football field in the Amazon is cleared to produce 250 burgers. Every second. Okay. To produce one kilogram of beef requires 16,000 liters of water. That's a couple of swimming pools. To produce a loaf of bread is about 200 liters. The South African Local Government Association says that uh, we have a water crisis looming. I disagree. We just need to change the demand. Longline fishing, per sea nets, and drag nets are deemed sustainable by most fishing organizations around the planet. Let me just give you an example of what a long, long line is. Okay, just off the, the, the coastline of South Africa, to catch hake, they will drop a, a, drop a ship, will drop a line, it'll go 150 kilometers, and there will be 3,000 hooks on that, and it will catch anything. It doesn't discriminate. For every one kilogram of bycatch caught, I mean, for every one kilogram of fish caught, there are 10 kilograms of bycatch caught. On, on the shelves in Pick and Pay and in the shops that you go to, not by, the, or by their own admission, 80% roughly, is factory farmed. If you had to convert the demand uh, for meat and try to make it sustainable by using free range, we just don't have enough space. Globally, if we had to do it, we would need another planet to put all our cows and chickens and, and um, pigs. And finally, I just want to talk about humanity for a bit. We feed a third of our cereal and grain to cows, chickens, and pigs while one billion people on this planet are starving. A quarter of the grain grown in developing countries, such as South Africa or um, Central Africa, where people are hungry, where people go hungry, we take that food and we feed it to um, animals in America and in South Africa to feed meat, to feed our addiction to meat. It's just not a fair system. We're also taking all our antibiotics and feeding it to animals. 60% of all antibiotics in South Africa are put into feed, which then gets given to, um, to animals, and then in turn we eat it. So in closing, I just want to say, by switching to a plant-based diet, you have the biggest positive impact on your planet. I think by going radical or um, in some way dictatorial and saying no more, I do not think that solves the problem whatsoever. What will solve the problem is if we all truly start questioning what we put inside our bodies. We all have a responsibility. You can call it being a farmer by proxy. Um, there is a lot of nonsense going into our systems. And if you don't question it, you don't know. But by forcing people not to eat meat, they're going to want to eat it more. Because that's human nature. So if we say no more meat on the menu, then uh, people will probably find illegal eateries where you're roasting a cow in the back or something like that. Because that's human nature. If you can't have it, you want it. So we should instead, we really should say, what, what are we trying to achieve? What are we trying to achieve, first of all, with this debate? It's really to solve the problem of this industrial farming, of this, I don't know, it's, it, people are... I grew up in a household where it was all about moderation. If we are talking about taking meat off the menu, is McDonald's included in that? Because then I have a hell of a lot to say about it. And I'll say yes, because... It's not good for you. And I've been advocating a lot. If you, if you please think, think about what you're putting into your mouth, into your system. Think where it came from. Think of the impact it had. But what is the impact on you that's digesting it? I don't have to eat meat every day. I don't want to say we have to have meat on the menu or animal protein. Not at all. But we have to have a choice. And that choice has to be calculated. It has to be researched. If we take meat off the menu, what do we serve instead? We're going to force feed people morality? It's not going to work. If you don't believe it, you're not going to live it. 
You have to understand the magnitude of the problem, and you have to educate people. Now, adults and habits, whew, I don't know, it's, it's tricky, but there are a lot of children out there. And I tell you, my child knows what is good for him. He's only nine. But when we drive past the McDonald's, he goes, fake food, fake food. He won't go there. When friends, parents want to take him, he says, no, 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 I'm not eating that. It's going to make me sick. Um, and I think that's where our responsibility lies. And we have to stop wasting. The way to win this is to collaborate and to educate and to really live with respect, respect for each other, respect for yourself, and respect for the animals that we are serving. Thank you. One of the fundamental differences between humans and non-humans on an ethical, moral, and legal level is the right to choice. And we as humans, the supposed intelligent species, who might I add, is willingly and knowingly destroying the only habitat we have, choose to exercise this right in a sadistic, selfish, damaging, and lethal manner with no regards to those we inflict the damage upon. We have, as a species have become so arrogant that we consciously choose to condemn others to death for our own pleasure. If I gave you a piece of raw meat, no salt, no spices, no marinade, no sauce, chances are you would grimace and refuse to eat it. Bullying is defined as forcibly imposing your will on another at their expense for your own gain and pleasure. Eating meat is an extreme form of bullying. In this case, your victim paid the ultimate price. He or she paid for it with her or his life. Your victim had no choice. Do unto others, right? Well, I suppose that only counts when you're not the victim. So what have we as humans become? Have we become so callous that the life of another doesn't warrant the slightest regard? Non-human animals bleed the same way human animals do. And trust me, they fear death the same way you, you, you do. The bottom line is, it is totally and utterly unnecessary to eat animals and their products. I, and millions of others like myself, are living proof that we can live a full, healthy life without animals on our plates. And if I'm not proof enough, consider the fact that science provides us with irrefutable proof that vegan is healthier and that veganism is a savior of this planet. I can throw a bunch of statistics at you, easily, but I don't want to reduce veganism to a bunch of numbers. There are more reasons, scientifically and ethically, to opt for veganism than there are to opt for eating meat. If you want to ignore science and the ethics, then consider the most important reason of all, your humanity. Reclaim your humanity. Compassion isn't just a 10 letter word. It's not even a choice, it's a duty. We have an obligation, a duty, to be kind, to be considerate, and to be less selfish. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we lived in a world where those qualities were the rule rather than the exception? And you know what? It starts on your plate. So let's break the vicious violence cycle. Let's get a product of exploitation and destruction off our menus and out of our lives. If you believe you are what you eat, then the flesh of another obtained through violence, blood, fear, and death shouldn't even be a consideration. Veganism isn't the worst thing that can happen to you. So since you don't like meat, since you don't condone, condone cruelty, and since science shows us that getting animals off our menus is the best way to go, then why not just go vegan? If not for the animals, for you. Exercise your right to choice in a kind, gentle, and selfless way. Choose vegan. It literally changes lives. Thank you. I would start by acknowledging that I do think that much of our current meat consumption is immoral, 
Um, I think that feeding ourselves non-human animals on the scale that we do involves unavoidable and extremely um, unpleasant amounts of suffering, and I think that that's unconscionable that we, that we tolerate that. But So even if it is immoral to eat non-human animals in the way that we currently do, under the conditions that we currently do, like factory farming, it doesn't, of course, follow that eating meat is necessarily immoral and nor that it's immoral to sell meat or have it on your restaurant table. So that's the first issue. If it's possible to produce meat in a way that is humane, then we shouldn't make eating that kind of meat, the meat that is produced in that fashion, impermissible in an attempt to cut down on the meat that is being produced in a way that is morally impermissible that is morally abhorrent. Sentience, the ability to feel pain and pleasure, is not the same thing as understanding, as, as having goals and aspirations, as having even a concept of a life, of knowing that you have a life to be snuffed out. For animals that are not self-aware, and here there are a range of empirical issues that are really difficult, and, and we won't go into them in great detail now, but for animals that are not self-aware, I believe there are such animals. So there are various ways of establishing this. One way that's quite popular is as, is what's called the mirror test, so in other words, being able to recognize oneself in a mirror. There's some animals that pass this, so uh, dolphins, whales, uh, Asian elephants, not African elephants, um, the European magpie. There are various animals that pass this test. Chickens don't pass this test. Uh, cows don't pass this test. Pigs are ambiguous at this point. Our moral judgments need to be responsive to evidence is a key point that I'd like to make. Things that are not self-aware, assuming they can be killed without pain, I don't see the grounding of a moral obligation to not eat those animals. I can see there being aesthetic repulsion, I can see there being, uh, there being uh, preferences in these regards, but I don't see what grounds a moral obligation to refrain from killing these animals in a pain-free way, as long as one can, of course, farm them in a pain-free way. To put it bluntly, having a choice, i.e. the choice of veganism or vegetarianism, doesn't yet entail a moral obligation to make that particular choice. It's one of a range of choices, and we need to argue for why that is the better choice than any other one. So to summarize that bit of what I was saying, animals who are not self-aware are not morally equivalent to us. Okay, so the same sorts of standards as to how we might treat animals that are self-aware and human sorts of animals are not, uh, there's no equivalence there. To put it even more crudely, our own interests, no matter how base you might consider those interests to be, trump the interests of something that does not have any interests. Myself as a meat eater would be quite happy if we were to raise the prices of meat dramatically and make it something that you no longer feel entitled to eat. And with the extra revenue that's raised through such a prohibitive sort of increase in price, you can ensure that there are enough inspectors to go around to farms and make sure that people are not abusing animals and not raising them in these abusive sorts of conditions. I'm suggesting behavior modification. I'm suggesting that we nudge people into a more responsible and humane way of doing this. I think a utilitarian approach here argues for a tapering off rather than a, a, a managed tapering off rather than an abolition of meat production and sale. I think we'd be passing up an op people are going to be eating meat in any case, basically. And I think we'd be passing up an opportunity to enhance animal welfare if we, uh, if we don't do things like increase meat to disincentivize its consumption and use that uh, money responsibly. It's interesting that in the debate tonight, uh, there seems to be agreement that the suffering is unacceptable. And I'm not going to therefore focus on the suffering. Let's just take that as a given, that it is unacceptable. Uh, we're not in debate about that. Of course, there's some practical implications of that. If you think the suffering is unacceptable, then there are immediate changes you have to make to your diet. You can't say, I'm opposed to suffering. I don't believe we should be eating animals that have suffered, and yet continue about your ordinary shopping and eating habits. Would it be acceptable to eat humans that had been reared humanely and then slaughtered humanely? And I don't think that anybody here in this room would seriously say that that would be acceptable. And so the question is, what is the difference between a non-human animal and a human animal that can justify this differential treatment? One characteristic that somebody might suggest is that uh, humans have higher level cognition than animals do. This is the very argument that Jacques Rousseau was referring to. Uh, humans are self-aware self -aware in the way in which many animals are not. 
This argument, though, is an unfortunate one because clearly the elevated cognition is not a mechanism for separating all humans from all uh, non-human animals. There are many humans that don't have these higher order levels of cognition, that are not self-aware. It's true of all human babies, but if you think you want to invoke a kind of potentiality argument and say that those babies have the potential to be self-aware, well, it's certainly not true of some babies, those who will never develop those capacities. It's also not true of those human beings that have lost the capacity of self-awareness or have lost the higher levels of cognition. Uh, they don't have this very feature which you are suggesting would differentiate humans from animals and thereby war warrant the painless killing of the animals. If you thought that cognition, self-awareness, that these things really were what counts, then you would need to say that it is okay to kill humans uh, who fit into the category of not being self-aware as long as you did it painlessly after having reared them uh, painlessly. So why should we not kill uh, sentient beings, beings that are capable of feeling, of experiencing, whether they be humans or non-human uh, animals? Well, uh, Jacques Rousseau has introduced the idea that because they're not self-aware, perhaps it is okay to kill these beings. And I can't give you a knockdown argument, a definitive argument, to say that uh, killing these beings is wrong. I can't even give you a knockdown definitive argument that killing one of you or killing me would be wrong. There's an interesting philosophical argument, an ancient philosophical argument, which says that death is never a harm. Dying in certain ways may be harmful, but ending somebody's life, somebody dying, even painlessly, is not harmful. Uh, there's an interesting argument for that, uh, for that conclusion. I'm not going to elaborate on that now. The point is that we can't be sure that that argument works. There's lots of ongoing philosophical debate about an argument of that kind, and we're certainly not going to uh, err on the side of, of uh, being cavalier and taking lives in the hope that this argument is true. When we've got a kind of contested philosophical issue of this kind, uh, you want to err on the side of caution, I think. And the side of caution here is to say, well, maybe it's not a harm for me to kill you painlessly in your sleep, but I could be wrong about that. And if I could be wrong about that and I've killed you, I may have done something very, very serious to you, so I ought to desist really from killing you. And I would say something similar about an animal, an animal that's not self-aware and a human that's not self-aware. Perhaps we do do no harm to them uh, by killing them painlessly. But there's no knockdown argument for that, and we should err on the side of caution, particularly since we can err on the side of caution, particularly since we can uh, meet all our dietary needs we can live perfectly healthy lives without consuming the flesh of animals, whether they be human animals or, uh, or non-human animals. Uh, yes, we do live in a democracy, and in democracy you do have freedom of speech uh, granted to you. And you also have freedom of choice, but within constraints. So my freedom to choose does not include uh, the choice to kill you. If I want to kill you, a democratic society is justified in stopping my doing that, even if I protest that I'm doing it uh, painlessly, painlessly to you. It might be a great amount of pleasure to me, but I'm, I'm still not allowed to do it. I'm still not allowed to do it. So a democracy has its uh, limitations. One final point, since my time is nearly up. Uh, I have not made the claim that the lives of those beings that are not self-aware have the same value as the lives of beings that are self-aware. It's entirely possible that self-aware beings have uh, more value than those that are not self-aware. But that doesn't mean to say that those that are not self-aware have no value. And when we're speaking about just desires, you want to satisfy a desire to eat uh, flesh, uh, then you don't have a good reason for overriding the value that that animal life has. Uh, it has all the value that that animal um, uh, it, it sees in it. That life is all that animal has, and it cares a great deal about it, even if not as much as you do about your life. <laughs>